Welcome to This Week in Prophecy with James Jacob Prash, presented by Maury LTV. My name is Joshua, here with James Jacob Prash on uh, Tuesday, December 17, <coughs> 2019. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. I'm back from the sunny clime of Southeast Asia, where we had a wonderful, blessed time with our <clears throat> children in the Philippines we take care of. But now I'm back in the cold, damp northern hemisphere. As you can hear the rain, I'm back of me. Nonetheless, here we are, and the Lord is with us this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the news has been dominated much by the British elections. The prophetic significance of these elections is, of course, the growing anti-Semitism in Europe and Britain, partially related to the increase in Islamic populations and their militancy against Israel and increasing anti-Semitism. A voice in the support of Hamas terror, the terror organization, has been Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party. <clears throat> he embodies what the left wing of the Democratic Party, represented by the squad, are in the United States, coming into the mainstream and getting control of the party. Something incredible happened this week in prophecy. Incredible. In Britain, what is called blue in America is red, the more conservative party, roughly the equivalent of the Republican Party, broadly speaking. On the other hand, what is red is blue. Blue is the color of the Democratic Party in the United States, but it's the color of the Labour Party, that is the left center and left wing party of Great Britain. Blue is red and red is blue. The same as the blue wall crumbled in 2016, when manufacturing states of the Rust Belt and the Midwest collapsed and went into the column of Mr. Trump turning against Hillary Clinton, the same thing happened this week in Great Britain, particularly in the north of England. Traditional Labour Party strongholds collapsed one after another, changing color, going from red to blue, and is going from Labour to Conservative. There were two main reasons for this. The first reason is of prophetic significance, as is the second. God is showing Britain mercy, getting away <clears throat> from the European Union, which we have stated for many years is without doubt the embryo of what Daniel predicted would happen in chapter two of Daniel with the rebirth of the nations that were in the Roman Empire. God has shown Britain mercy. Now, unfortunately, the position of Boris Johnson, again, a native New Yorker with the same hairstyle as President Trump, is <clears throat> one that will keep Britain associated with Europe and voluntarily agree to a lot of European regulations. But at least Britain will not be in the EU. This will give it more freedom to negotiate with the United States and with the new American USMCA accords taking place on the other side of the Atlantic. As we've been saying, Mr. Trump's strategy is to build an English-speaking common market of Australia, possibly New Zealand, of Great Britain, perhaps eventually Ireland forced into it by economic reality, <clears throat> theoretically India, the largest English-speaking democracy in the world, and of course, you know, with Australia, the United States and Canada, with a cheap labor market in Mexico, India, the largest market in the world, now with a population overtaking China's, it would be a formidable economic power block against China or against the European Union <clears throat> or against any resurgence <clears throat> of Japan or other economies. Nothing would come near it. This is the way it is moving. But let's understand this more in depth. There is the Daniel 2 aspect, but the other aspect is Jeremy Corbyn, an enemy of Israel, seen popularly as an anti-Semite, supportive of Hamas, a terror organization, aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. 
What we've seen repeatedly is traditional Labour voters in Britain stating, we want out of Europe, that's what we voted for. We don't want the political establishment forcing something down our throat, we voted against by referendum. Even people who were pro-Remain do not like democracy being usurped by the corrupt British establishment led by figures such as Tony Blair, who wanted a second referendum. Well, in effect, the second referendum has happened, and the people voted, even by a bigger majority, to leave Europe. God's hand was against Jeremy Corbyn, an enemy of Israel. This took place this week in prophecy. But the ripple effects across the Atlantic are obvious. One commentator after another is saying that this is a harbinger of what to expect in the 2020 elections in the United States. You have the growing Jew hatred and anti-Israelism, represented by Kliab and Omar and AOC and the Quartet in the American Congress Democratic Party membership. You see this increasing anti-Semitism and an alienation of, of many American Jews beginning to take place in the United States as it has in Britain. You see the Democratic Party unable to get a leader who people will rally around, as happened in Great Britain when they were stuck with Mr. Corbyn. And you see a reaction against the establishment. It took place in Britain, and it almost certainly is a harbinger of what is likely to transpire in the United States in the general elections especially with the economy doing reasonably well apart from the crisis of the deficits that no one is addressing. Nonetheless, there is another side of this that people are not looking at. In England, the only viable alternative to the Labour Party and those wanting to remain in Europe Bearing in mind originally, the Labour Party was opposed to Europe. The only alternative was the Conservative Party. The Liberal Democrat Party, the third party, was even more pro-Europe and is even more, more pro-European Union than the Labour Party. So there was no alternative but to vote Conservative, and that is what the English electorate did. In Scotland... Not so. The Scottish Nationalist Party gained an incredible number of seats at the expense of the Labour Party. Scotland already had a referendum voting to remain part of the UK. But now the Scottish National Party is doing the same thing as Labour did in Great Britain, demanding a second referendum to negate the democratic will expressed by the Scottish voters. They are claiming that the increase in seats gained in Scotland by the Scottish National Party in the Parliament warrants a second referendum in reaction to the first one in which most people in Scotland wanted to remain in the United Kingdom. Northern Ireland, for the first time in the history of Northern Ireland, between the Republicans, Sinn Féin, that is the political wing of the traditional IRA, although it's somewhat denied by some people, that's the reality. Or the IRA being the military wing of Sinn Féin. And the other nationalist Irish parties are now the majority. The orange parties, that is the Protestant Unionists, are the minority party. What does this spell for the future? In the Good Friday agreements, it was uh, concluded that if there was a electoral shift and a demographic shift to Irish nationalism away from unionism, that this would be achieved democratically. A major step potentially towards the reunification of the public, Republic of Ireland took place this week in Great Britain, in Northern Ireland, and in the Republic of Ireland. This is not good in certain respects. 
as we pointed out, the Northern Irish Unionists <clears throat> had a high, a very high evangelical representation. It was they who fought same-sex marriage and non-therapeutic abortion somewhat successfully until the British establishment in London began to undermine the democratic will of the people of Northern Ireland. <clears throat> now, however, they have lost their political influence. The disaster of Theresa May's leadership of the Conservative Party <clears throat> and the hopeless incompetence she displayed as Prime Minister made it absolutely essential when Boris Johnson replaced her that the 11 seats in the Northern Irish Unionist Party came into coalition with the Tories, otherwise there would have been a Labour government. The Parliament was essentially hung. Now, the Unionist parties are not important to forming a majority government. Boris Johnson does not need them any longer. They have also lost majority control of Northern Ireland. The reality of this election, although a defeat for Mr. Corbyn, although a step forward for British-Israel relations, although a blow to political Islam in Great Britain, although a step forward in Anglo-American relations, all of those good things, the potential of the ground being set for a breakup of the UK is being underreported by the media. The Scottish National Party is now, now the third largest party in the UK, bigger than the Liberal Democrats who were the traditional third party. They are there, and they are forced to be reckoned with, certainly in Scotland. And for the first time, the Protestant Unionists no longer are in political control of Northern Ireland electorally. The outcome of these events remains to be seen, but we should understand there is ramifications that may affect world events in such a way as prophecy is impacted in the way it manifests. Britain <clears throat> may not be Britain, although England is a stronger England. The UK may be on the verge of a crisis of disintegration. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I am saying the first phase for it to take place has now occurred this week and this week in prophecy. Victory against Europe and the unelected socialist bureaucracy of Brussels, yes. Victory against anti-Semitism, yes. Victory against anti-Americanism, yes. But defeat against unity within the UK. Let's move on. This week in prophecy, Impeachment proceedings against President Trump have been launched with two articles of impeachment that are legally and politically considered to be very weak. The case is crumbling, so much so that Nancy Pelosi and other Democrats have been addressing other issues for the first time. The USMCA, the replacement for NAFTA, was passed. Also legislation on creating a space force that will be to the U.S. Air Force what the U.S. Marines are to the U.S. Navy, a force within a force, a branch of the armed services within another branch of the armed services. <clears throat> In response to the growing weaponization of space by both Russia and China is being legislated as we speak. Again, other issues are coming into play other than impeachment. The very fact that this has happened and the China trade deal has taken place despite the push for impeachment, the media, even the Democrats, are beginning to speak of these other issues. They're beginning to act in Congress voting on these other issues. 
there is even one member of the House contemplating leaving the Democratic Party and becoming a Republican over impeachment. As impeachment begins to disintegrate, the Democratic Party sees it becoming more of a political liability in an election year and are beginning to gravitate away from it. Hypocrisy upon hypocrisy. Some people are so committed to it, they can't gravitate away from it. Obviously, Adam Schiff being one of them. But Nancy Pelosi is doing her usual political two-step. She's speaking about it less and speaking about other issues more. Why, all of a sudden, are they backing away? The media, of course, is spinning the Horowitz report and investigations as they wish. The fact of the matter is, the Horowitz report shows that the FBI did indeed spy, and it shows the basis of the FISA warrants were the Steele dossier paid for by the Clinton administration and that the FBI continued to lie concerning them. Nonetheless, leave it to the left-wing media to overstate the fact that the report says there was no proof that it was undertaken in order to shift the election in a particular direction. Rogue agents such as Strzok and Page may have wanted to do that and acted accordingly within the FBI, but there was no concerted effort within the FBI to sway the election, says the report. This, even if true, does not alter the fact that there was corruption in the FBI that they applied for warrants on the basis of a fake dossier paid for by Hillary Clinton's campaign, and that the FBI continued to lie to keep this dossier a viable basis for the investigations of the Trump campaign. Well, what's happening? What is indeed happening? What's happening is this. We see what transpires in Britain, transpires in America, and we see what transpires in America, transpires in Britain. But then the third leg of the tripod becomes what's happening in Israel. Again, the weaponization of the judiciary against Mr. Netanyahu on charges that are largely superfluous, being politically amplified out of proportion. Israel, unable to find the government, has been told by its president that if it doesn't find the government, it is going to have to go the third elections. This is the first time in Israel's history this has happened, where the president of the country, Reuven Rivlin, has told the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, to form a government. The December 11th deadline has come and gone this week in prophecy. Meanwhile, the Israeli courts have ruled that Mr. Netanyahu, on an interim basis, may still remain as prime minister in a caretaker government, pending either the forming of a new government or new elections. Israel's attorney general may make an announcement within days, weeks at most, but quite possibly within days, if or not to pursue a prosecution of Mr. Netanyahu. It's all up in the air. The huge political gamble of Great Britain paid off for Mr. Johnson. It is a huge political gamble taking place in Israel. So far, it is deadlocked, completely deadlocked. The parliament in Britain was deadlocked under Theresa May. The Knesset in Israel is now deadlocked, and the only way out is a big electoral gamble. It's amazing on what transpires between these three countries, or among these countries, the United States, 
Britain and Israel. They parallel each other in the unfolding of events and this cannot be coincidental. There is a spiritual dimension to the dynamic. We are absolutely convinced of this. This week in prophecy, for the first time, Israel has become a major exporter of natural gas. It will export the natural gas to Egypt, where it can be either consumed or re-exported as liquid gas out of the Egyptian ports of Port Said and Alexandria to markets in Europe and beyond, or not inconceivably from the port of Suez into the Indian Ocean Basin. Israel is now an exporter of natural gas, and it is coming from the Tartus and Leviathan fields. This is taking place at the same time Turkey in league with Libya is trying to extend a strategic economic control zone, hemming in the Tamar and the Leviathan fields. As we've been saying, watch this space. But now a new factor has been placed into the Middle East equation in Israel-Arab relations. Israel has also become an energy exporter. And an Arab nation, the most populous Arab nation, has an economic interest in it. This week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, it was reported that last week, Russian fighter planes were scrambled and forced Israeli jets to return back to Israel. This is unconfirmed, but there is a growing Russian presence in Syria. The Deputy Prime Minister of Russia, Yuri Beresov, came for conference talks with the Assad regime this week in prophecy, wanting to rebuild a large naval base in Syria uh, that would function for forward operations for the Russian Navy. Now, Russia retook Crimea by simply grabbing it from the Ukraine and the port of Odessa. Going through the Black Sea, Russia has been trying to improve its relations with Turkey to have access to the Dardanelles and the Straits of Bosporus into the Eastern Mediterranean and now establish forward operating naval presences in the Eastern Mediterranean in league with Syria. Russia, during the Cold War, had the upper hand in the Eastern Mediterranean in both Egypt and Syria under Kamul Abdul Nasser. This was reversed following the Yom Kippur War and the Israeli victories in 1967 and the 1973. The conflict in 1967 and 73 were almost subsidiaries of the Cold War between the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. It was seen as an East versus West confrontation, more than an Arab-Israeli confrontation. Not so now. Mr. Putin is trying to reestablish the Russian presence that was lost in 1973 under Anwar Sadat, Menachem Begin, Camp David, the negotiations of Henry Kissinger to reopen the Suez Canal after the 1973 war, etc. Russia got the boot. Russia is trying to get back in. Not to Egypt, but certainly to Syria this week in prophecy. Now, this is important. Russia has done everything it can to reassert what it was. It lost the Warsaw Pact. It lost the Soviet Union. It lost the CIS, the Confederation of, of Independent States. And then Russia itself began to fragment with the Islamic Rebellion in Chechnya. 
Mr. Putin comes and tries to restore as much of the Russian Empire or the former Soviet Empire as he could. He has not made major headway. Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, um, obviously the Ukraine, these things are gone and they're in the Western sphere of influence. But he's grabbing what he can. Certainly Crimea, where he had a demographic advantage, and now into Syria once again. Whether or not these things will eventually relate to an Ezekiel 38 and 39 conflict, as some people speculate, remains to be seen. But it is of prophetic significance, and it's happening this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, we have a major development in Lebanon. The protests against the expansion of Iranian influence that took place in southern Iraq have strongly occurred likewise in Lebanon, as we've been saying. President Aoun postponed negotiations to find the new prime minister of Lebanon following the resignation of Saeed Hariri, who was very much aligned with Haddad in Syria and accommodating of Iran and the Iranian, the Iranian-sponsored Hezbollah contingent in southern Lebanon. The Christian population, however, of Lebanon opposes Hariri. Meanwhile, there have been riots by the Amal Shia Muslims. Lebanon is in a mess. One thing is clear. There is a resistance and a growing resistance to the influences that have been had both directly and via Syria of Iran in Lebanon. Pray for this situation, that the hands of Iran will not manipulate Lebanon as it already has a foothold on Israel's northern border through Hezbollah. But it's happening this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, and a major purchase was made of an Israeli high-tech company, Haboni, leading developers of artificial intelligence. Israel punches well above its weight in all high-tech industries, but are pioneers in certain aspects of <clears throat> the development of artificial intelligence. The United States has used Israel and Israeli companies as a research and development offshore facility, capitalizing on Israeli expertise and brain power to put itself further in front of potential competitors. The area north of Tel Aviv, in places such as Herzliya, are basically a colony of the Silicon Valley. American and American-owned Israeli companies dominate the area in research and development. But this week, Intel has made a purchase of the leading Israeli artificial intelligence company. Now, what this means is this. We're not just talking about a military, strategic, or a political alliance of the United States and Israel anymore. Now we are talking about the cyber economy and the future of cyber warfare, potentially. Certainly, artificial intelligence. What had been a strategic and political partnership and alliance is increasingly becoming an economic and a technological one with the development of the Leviathan energy basin off the Mediterranean coast of Israel, the Tamar fields, but now this major takeover by Intel of the leading Israeli artificial intelligence developing company. This is important. Strategic partnership between the United States and Israel, 
juxtaposed next to technological partnership between the United States and Israel at the forefront of the technology of the future, transpiring this week in prophecy. Once more, the mainstream media has not given due attention to some of the most important developments taking place anywhere in the world. What's happening with China? What's happening in the Middle East? What's really happening in Britain and Europe? We know what's happening. What's happening is what this book says will happen. And we see it happening, as always, this week in prophecy. Please keep Israel, Britain, and the United States in your prayers. Pray for the body of Christ in those countries and for the prospering of the gospel. One of the things I'm asking people to pray about is this. A semi-liberalization of Saudi Arabia under Mohammed bin Salman. The economic realities of Israel becoming an energy exporter in partnership with, 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 with customers in Egypt, possibly for re-export to Europe. These things spell opportunity. As these countries liberalize, the opportunity for the gospel can be capitalized on. It doesn't take much, but more freedom of religion in the Middle East will mean an incredible amount. It's disappearing in China. I was just in Vietnam, where there were families in rural Vietnam displaced from their homes by the local communist parties living in huts in the jungle. Their homes are just confiscated. Yet in the cities, there's a growing amount of religious freedom in Vietnam. Things are happening. Things are changing. On back of all of these political, economic, and strategic events, there's the hand of God preparing the way for the return of Jesus and creating opportunities for the gospel before he returns. Please remember these things in your prayer and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for President Trump. On a personal note, but also on behalf of all at Moriel, we just want to say that when Joshua Chavez first came on board with us, helping us produce Moriel TV, we were less than technically competent. We also had a viewership about one third of what it has become. Subscriptions have nearly, very nearly tripled under Joshua's direction and his production efforts. He's been a tremendous blessing to all of us. He will still work with us occasionally and periodically. He's leaving on good terms, both personally, relationally and otherwise, to build his own ministry in tandem with ours going the same direction, doctrinally, but a different ministry. And we wish him every blessing and every success, and he will still be helping us on certain projects from time to time. But Joshua, we just want to say, on behalf of all of us at Moriel globally, on behalf of our viewers and subscribers, thank you so much, and may you know the Lord's blessing in the new year and in your future endeavors. Hope to be seeing you again soon and working with you for the advancement of the cause of Jesus. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless and have a wonderful, wonderful holiday. Hanukkah, the Nativity, the Civil New Year, as you wish. May God bless. Thank you. Thank you.